Hello, hello, hello! This is Lapcat, and welcome back! Uh, I'm doing things a little bit different today. Today I'll be using the mic without the fobbity, the, the filter thing that's on it. Hopefully this will get rid of some of the noise. I'm also going to try to talk quieter. A lot of things. This is largely to help me figure out how this mic works. Nonetheless, it's going to be an episode as always. Today I'm going to try to talk about my opinions and therefore commentary on how schools could be better evaluated and the teachers and administrators therein. Students are judged, or rather evaluated is their preferred term, to determine whether or not they know a subject through some form of test. This is namely in the form of a standardized test where all the students within a very wide, very large area are all given the same test, and therefore you can properly evaluate how each student is doing comparative to their area, as well as their other states. This form of standardized testing has allowed for us to be able to nationalize education in such a way that every student is being taught more or less the same stuff. Trying to test students that way I feel is a little bad because it results in the teachers always resorting to teaching to the test. And if a teacher isn't teaching to the test, well, they're probably doing something wrong. At the very least, that's in the eyes of the administrators. Worse yet is that schools often do not try to reflect what the outside world needs. A recent podcast that I had listened to, which was by, I believe, Freakonomics Radio, wherein they were talking about math and how bad it is taught in schools, and I agree with that. After all, most people are taught Algebra 2 and Trigonometry. There is no reason, well, well, there is a reason to learn Trigonometry as it has a lot of different rules that define triangles, and I would very much argue me personally at least, that the triangle is the fundamental shape of the universe. I say this because if you were to have any object and you were able to map it out with only triangles, what an object is, like dimensionally, based off of only three measurements of a fraction of that same object, that I find is outstanding and a true beauty of math. Anyway, Algebra 2. The Freakonomics Radio had also mentioned this, but I'll mention it for you, the listener, right now. Algebra 2 is largely taught for the purpose of making human calculators. This was in a time during the Cold War where people were wanting to get to space and People didn't have a calculator with them 24-7, but that's not true anymore. We do have a calculator literally in our pockets all the time, on our wrists if you include Apple watches or smart watches. It is directly because of the fact that we have these devices with us 24-7 that we're able to get around the fact that we don't really need Algebra 2 anymore. The only parts of algebra and calculus that are typically required. I'm in a weird lane right now because it's like merge lanes on my right and then on a regular traffic is on my left. I'm going five below what I what most people are usually going so I'm in the slow lane. Anyway the primary things that people need today are and if anything is how to do integrals, derivatives, basic trigonometry, so like sine, cosine, and tangent, order of operations, and a few different basic rules like um, maybe the quadratic formula? I don't really know. Because of our very specialized world that we're living in today, where you can't get far with the general education anymore, Being able to know your one subject very well really matters now. People being taught 
calculus, basically, in high school, is something I find stupid. It's not something they would ever really need today. And the general argument that I hear, or at least I heard as a student taking Algebra 2, was what would happen if the world, like, ended tomorrow and you, you're you not going to have this, you're not going to have a calculator with you then? Well, my one thought is I'm going to have much bigger issues than figuring out the derivative of, I don't know, the loop in a roller coaster. I really don't need to know that. That's, as far as I know, why we still take upper level math in high school. While I do agree that you need math, a lot of college teachers now report that, again, from Freakonomics Radio, they report that if the student knows the general basics very well, the college professors will take care of everything else. But instead, high school teachers will teach everything very poorly. Which then means the college teachers are mostly just stuck, and the college students then have to retake a class. It's really sad, actually. Again, on Freakonomics Radio, they bring up the notion of data science to replace algebra and upper level math because most people today just a general person needs to know how to understand read and utilize large sets of data after all anyone can walk into a grocery store and understand that the price of milk at one store might be different from a different store but that might say a lot of stuff about those two different stores you can use that data somewhere else. It's a very, very strict analysis of what you could do with data science, but it's an example. It's understanding data science allows you to realize you can't have two and a half kids in an average. It just doesn't work. Which, mind you, I believe is like the current average of kids two parents in the U.S. right now. Anyway, going back to my primary topic of properly evaluating students and their teachers. First, having a standardized test that matches what the students need in the real world really matters. Hopefully, the last couple of minutes that I spent talking about this really gets to that point that whatever the students are learning in school should reflect what they actually need and will use. It's hot. It's like really hot in my car right now. Um, so you might have just heard me turn up the fan a little bit. Anyway, my thought was perhaps students could do like anonymous surveys to like at the end of the year to see how they how the teachers did. Um, these surveys could utilize their student ID to actually make sure that's only one person that does it. Like each student only gets one chance. Um, and I was kind of thinking about it in my head the other day where I thought the students could evaluate the teachers how they taught and how well what they did good and what they did bad. All of this can be compiled very easily, very quickly. It'd be fairly easy to do overall. And you might be wondering, well, what about the students that just kind of like just check like all the boxes? Well, for one, you can have it as an online survey. So all those things are restricted. They don't really have the option to simply check all the boxes anymore. Second, as a part of restricting what students um, can and cannot take the test based on whether or not they did it before, you can also extend that so you can blacklist students from being able to actually have their survey score counted. Like if a su certain student, like multiple times or shows good reason, I, I mean, showed good cause to the administration, the administration can just say, you don't get to, your opinion 
will not be heard. You have lost that privilege. I am a firm believer that everyone has a right to speak, but you have, but it's a privilege, a privilege to be heard. This car really wants to go in front of me for some reason. It's like on an emerged lane, you know? Oh man. And I, I was in front of them. And then there are, well, anyway, they felt like they had to go in front of me for whatever reason. I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm going more of the speed limit. It is a work zone, so I'm going a fair bit slower, but I mean, you should be. It's a work zone. Right, so where was I? Having students being able to do these surveys will be able to give teachers and teachers a good idea of what they're doing right. This could be namely useful for if teachers want to do different things for different classes to see which of those classes are the best. That's one simple use of it. Because usually you don't get taught everything when you're getting your teaching credential. So having teachers be given the freedom to experiment with their classes to figure out the best way that they teach and the best way that their students typically respond, that is a good thing. Second, it could allow for the administration to realize what teachers are actually good. Some teachers are just outright bad and more than anything cause a negative impact to the student. After all, if you're going to a class where you consciously are aware as a student that if you spent that same time reading the textbook, you would learn more, the teacher's clearly doing something wrong. Those textbooks aren't designed to be simply read. That's just not how they work. Um, you can, of course, that's why you can read them and understand what it's trying to say, but a teacher's job, in my opinion at least, is to simplify that, boil it down, and make it easily digestible for the students. Or at the very least, that's the popular opinion here in the US about what teachers are. Whether or not that opinion's right, that's for you to decide. I'm merely working off of the already defined description. In any case, if you as a student, or a, a class I suppose, are all terrible students, the teacher should also have the right to put out their own survey, or, or at least their own response. That, of course, assuming they don't name any names, they'd be able to directly point out what groups of students are bad. And using that kind of data, the administration and teachers should be able to better realize how things work better. For instance, if it's found across all the classes one year that the students of that year are very, very adept at working in groups, maybe the administration could suggest to all teachers that have those, that have those students next year to use groups, namely for the classes that are year specific. Looking at California, namely my high school that I went to, freshmen are required to take health and geography the first year. If it's found that students are very skilled or learn much better in groups in that setting, maybe um, the second year for their mandatory requirement could also be in groups, namely like that English class that year, because usually English classes are um, progressive, so you'll generally have the same students in the English class anyway. I feel like you understand my point with that. Sometimes some work, some things work for an entire group of students one year, but not for the next. Evidence for that's well enough by realizing that a football team of one class a year at a high school is typically different from the football team of another year. Weird, I know, crazy. It's, I find it odd that schools 
are determined how good or bad based off of the collective ability of their of all of their um, sports teams, which is wrong. It's defined by how good that one team is that year, as well as those coaches. It's ridiculous. In any case, oh, and don't get me started on student athletes being able to completely overturn their requirements to be on the team. I find that stupid in and of itself. But for another time, I'll talk about that another time. Allowing for this survey, a more simplified version could be freely available to the students to access at any time, be it in paper or electronic format, so that the students can voice their complaints or compliments to certain faculty, teachers, and blah, 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 blah. Yes, that was on purpose. Uh, you know, whoever they want to express those things to or about so that their voice can be heard. This goes back to that privilege of being heard. They're able to have the administration be able to collect this data, present to the school, to their school board. The school board can then make a ruling of maybe things that need to get changed. Maybe this like one simple thing that would literally cost like 50 bucks that one of the board members could just pull out of their wallet could get fix this surprisingly simple problem, but causes a lot of annoyances, but not many mention. One such thing could be like one or two um, floor tiles that are really messed up in a certain classroom. While it's not a big enough deal to like write a whole report and a complaint, a few students could bring it up that it's really bothering them. And this teacher's gonna be like, all right, I mean, the school board member can be like, all right, I'm done. Just get the same tile. Here's the, here's the money. I'll pay for it as a donation. Just get it done. <laughs> it could be that simple. Um, and going back to the ability to blacklist, if a student puts in like 10 of those tiny reports, uh, those complaints or compliments, like in a week, which is way more than someone should be doing, like maybe at max one a day, maybe even like three a week, and that's like two you don't get a day to send a complaint. Even that I still think is a little too high because that's a lot of data to crunch if you have a lot of students. If the student is doing a lot of those, you could just blacklist them for spamming. And they no longer have the privilege to be heard. If they make really dumb remarks or it's clearly just clogging up the system by what they're doing, like it completely contradicts a lot of other students. Like they are a very small minority and it's clear that it's like, oh, well, the tile is the wrong color. I wanted it purple, not blue. Yeah, yeah, that, that can just be blacklisted. They don't, they don't, they lose their privilege. And these privileges could be timed or they could be um, permanent or semi-permanent. And like, they could just go to the administration and ask for a, um, what is the word, the proper word? Expungement? I believe that's the word. When you have a crime removed. And the la very last thing I have to say about this matter of student evaluations is that I believe that students should be required in some capacity to do proper work. Um, that could be volunteer work. It could be showing up at the... Uh, uh, the board, the school board meetings. I say that because I was one of the high schoolers that did, and it's actually surprisingly interesting. Like you realize how much is going on by just going to one of those meetings. Like the everything is usually not left up to chance. The color palette is there for a reason. Um, like one might ask, why are the walls white instead of blue? And the roof might be blue instead of white. You could also reverse those, but usually there was a unified agreement of what to do. And only by being present, do you get to actually 
have the right to be, the privilege to be heard. By not being there, you basically give up that privilege voluntarily. This can be, a lot of people might disagree with this and say that it shouldn't be the same as volunteer work or um, helping out at the school, but I disagree. Going to, um, what is it called, um, earnings calls? Or like quarter reports that are done by stock, um, by companies for their public stocks? Those can be really enlightening sometimes. You'll realize like, why is the Doritos having pressure about making a bag of chips specifically targeted at women? Now, when you just hear that phrase, Doritos making a bag of chips specifically for women, that, that, that makes you think of a lot of bad things. But if you go to the earnings call, you'll be able to ask that question and get a clear response. It's like, well, it's chips that won't break in your purse. They, they won't stick to your f the dust. The flavoring, I don't really know what it's called, won't get stuck to your fingers, and you don't crunch them as loud. Which, all in all, would make really good bags of chips for students. Like, I mean, come on. They go into the... They often go into a backpack. They often get smashed. They're loud as all hell in a classroom. And at the end of the day, you can't even write very well with the stuff on your fingers. It's like, ugh, just bad. Just bad. It's actually a really good idea if you think about it. In any case, stock earnings calls, you could have a reason and like realize the importance of going to city hall meetings or the importance of voting and having like that different version of uh, being heard. Um, yeah, just, just the like. Doing, doing something like that where you personally witness what it means to have that privilege can mean a lot to someone. Uh, it personally it meant a lot to me. It's kind of why I recommend it. In any case, that's that. Um, let's see. As a large recap, I largely talked about the issues of standardized testing, standardized testing, and also how it's good. You know, it, it allows for a national education, but it also has teachers teaching to the test, and often if that test isn't right that is like theoretically subject wise or practically, then the students are being taught something wrong that won't help them in the future. That can be better understood by the students as a waste of their time rather than something meaningful. Something meaningful like data science that they will end up using no matter what profession you go into. Yes, that does include English. I also talked about the concept of having surveys at the end of the year or I guess depending on the situation like end of the semester quarter trimester whatever you do just so that the students and the teachers vice versa are able to indirectly communicate what each other is doing right and wrong what they can improve on and just get general understanding of how things are working in the classroom without being there of course, of course, this is all in the form of data, which goes back to the first thing, which is you need to know data science to really be a thing in the real world. Collecting data is actually really valuable. It's like how Facebook makes money. Anyway, and the very last detail that I brought up was students, students being required to go to student bo uh, school board meetings or doing something otherwise valuable. The reason why I named school board meetings specifically is because it allows for them to firsthand witness in a relatable field, that is their school, how the privilege of being heard matters. And like I had mentioned, that can relate to figuring out the truth of rumors in a stock earning call or going to city hall meetings to voice your concerns about some matter, I don't know, not on the bike lanes, just simple things like that. Having the privilege to be heard matters, 
And by you not showing up means you are foregoing that privilege. I won't say it's a right. Not all people deserve to be heard. It's a privilege. Everyone has a right to speak, but doesn't mean that they need to be listened to. And I believe that that's a very important distinction to make. In any case, that's really about it. I'm going to be pulling off in a moment to uh, close up and wrap up the video. Got to pull off anyway. Like I turned onto the road and now I'm like, wait a second. I know this road. I don't know a good spot to turn off on. But I turned off anyway because I have to go this way because it's the route I take. The questions are compounding. I could have just turned off right there, but I didn't. I forgot if that, that was there. Well, I can, I can just kind of stop the, the car, stop the video while I'm driving. No, I shouldn't do that. It's kind of unsafe. Well, I'm parked now. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the video. Hopefully I sound a bit better. Please let me know in the comments down below if I'm not. In any case, I got to get going now. It's about time to wrap this up. Like and subscribe if you haven't already. Leave a comment down below if you've got something to say. This has been Lopcat. Thanks for watching. Take care, all. Bye-bye.